Hey everybody, this is Andy with ModernMilitaryHistory.com. Thank you so much for tuning in to yet another podcast containing incredible history. The time has come for me to, quite frankly, open up a Patreon page because I need support. If you're not familiar with what Patreon is, it's a essentially peer-to-peer support system where you, the viewer, can give a monthly donation to me, the content creator, so that I can do things like afford a better camera, afford a better microphone, afford some soundproofing for my apartment, things like that. So if you're a fan of modern military history, the content that I've been bringing, consider just checking out this patron thing. You can go to patreon.com slash modern military history, and you can check out the three tiers of engagement where you can donate. There's like a dollar, five dollar, ten dollar, and each one of those actually gets you something. So you're getting something for your money. It's not just a donation. It's access to hidden videos that the public uh, doesn't get to see on my open channel. It's access to the ability to submit question and answer questions to me that I can answer on a quarterly basis in live Q&A sessions. It's just going to be me and you doing our absolute best to bring these veterans stories, bring these book reviews, bring these podcasts to the audience continually for free into the future. Thank you very much. You take care. Enjoy the podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Modern Military History Podcast. As always, I am your host, Andy. Today, we are joined by an incredible veteran, Jim Shorten Jones. And among his many accomplishments in his career, uh, both in the military and outside of the military, he was a member of MACV SOG. He served with CCC in SOG, and he is here today to tell us about his experiences. For first time listeners who have just found the show, MACV SOG is it's an incredible story. Where to begin? Um, MACV SOG was a clandestine group that focused on reconnaissance. Um, in areas of the war that were unpublished for decades after Vietnam. And it is our pleasure today to help bring that history into the light, into the forefront, by talking with incredible veterans such as Mr. Shorten. Sir, Jim, how are you doing today? I'm doing fine. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having, or excuse me, thank you for coming on. It's a pleasure having you. you know, I like to start folks, you know, right at the beginning because, you know, I love the war stories, but the fact that, you know, people were a part of the war stories is is super important to me. So I just kind of want to ask, sir, wh- where did your story begin? Where were you born? I was born in Liverpool, England. Okay. Okay. How was that? Uh, well, you know, I remember when I was a kid, you know, as I got a little bit older there, uh, I remember a lot of the buildings still laying in the streets and stuff mm-hmm. from World War II. Uh, a lot of the buildings were weakened by bombing and stuff, so they were still tearing them down for a few years after the war. When so they were still laying out in the streets and that sort of thing. What year? What year were you born? Uh, Forty six. Okay, yeah. So you were right. You were right after the war. Okay, this is really cool. Um, we had a guy on the podcast who was a uh, um, long range recon patroller. Um, and, uh, you know, then became a Green Beret, went on the Sante raid, um, Jake Jakovinko. And he oh, yeah. was born in U- the Ukraine. Uh, he was born in Ukraine, um, which is in the, the news a whole lot now. And I think if anybody wants to hear about Jake's um, experience as a young child during World War II, starting in the Ukraine and his parents' experiences, you know, it offers a great uh, vantage point on the history that we're seeing today. But Jake Jakovinko, he actually has memories of fleeing the Red Army. And he went through Berlin right before Berlin fell in 45. So this is really cool. You rem- This is makes me think about um, what, or what you just said makes me think about that. So you're literally born in the aftermath of the Second World War. That's right. really cool. Were they dealing with a lot of unexploded bombs and whatnot still in the city? No, I think that was already taken care of. Okay. They were just taking down the buildings that were um, that were weakened. You know, they had they couldn't repair them. They decided to take them down and rebuild another building. 
Um, but a lot of them were still on the streets. And I still remember driving down the streets and seeing, you know, they had all the brick pushed off to the side of the road as much wow. as they could so people can drive around it. So I remember all that. Um, but, you know, I didn't think a whole bunch about it at the time until my, my father told me what it was. Wow. So um, did you say you lived in England, in Liverpool, until you're 10? No, I lived there um, till I was five and then came back to the States. And when we came back to the States, my brother was born in New York. And then uh, there was some problems going on with the family. So we went back to England. And they got divorced. Mm. And about uh, when I was 11, I came back to the States. What happened to your accent? I wish I had it, man. <laughs> I just don't have an accent. It sounded like Paul McCartney. <laughs> you know, you can have the Liverpool accent going it. Oh, well. well, you know, Liverpool, they have that, that, that Cockney accent, yeah. you know, they cut all their words off. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I, I had a hard time understanding my dad half the time. <laughs> <laughs> so where was your dad from? Uh, he was from Liverpool. Okay. Um, the the short tent family, I think, came from, uh, uh, came from Ireland. Mm. And they, they came to Liverpool to work on the ships. Gotcha. When they were shorthanded looking for people to work on the ships in Liverpool. So uh, my father was a ship fitter. Okay. You know, so... Uh, but when I talked to all my cousins and as far back, my grandfather, they were all born in England, but I think it goes further back when they came from Ireland. So when you came to the U.S., when you, when you, I think, you know, if I'm hearing this correctly, that you're born in Liverpool, bounced to the U.S., bounced back, family stuff was going on. At some point you came back and settled in the U.S. And when was that and where did you end up settling down? Oh my gosh. Well, I was like 11. We, we were, we traveled all over the freaking country. Um, <laughs> yeah, we were in New York. Uh, then from New York, went to Florida, from Florida, we went to Texas. My stepfather had, um, he had a shrimp boat in Galveston Bay. Okay. And, um, then they would decide to go to Key West, Florida from there. The ship, the boat sank. It was the Eileen. It was a 46 foot shrimp boat. Jeez. It sank in that hurricane hit in 53. Oh, geez. Uh, down in Florida. And so uh, then he went to work for Coca-Cola down in Key West. That didn't go over real well. So we decided to go back up. We went to Oregon, um, Gold Hill, Oregon. We li lived there with my uncle for a while, my step-uncle, who was also a 30-year retired Navy guy. Wow. And uh, we uh, we stayed with him for a while. And then we went down to Colorado. I, I tell everybody I was raised in Colorado because that's where I learned a lot about, you know, living out in the woods and stuff mm -hmm. like that stalking animals and things mm -hmm. uh, and then from there i went to um, california and i just couldn't get along with my stepfather so i ran away from home when i was 16 quit high school and when i was 17 i joined the navy and i couldn't get in the navy right away because i wasn't a u.s citizen oh, so i had to go for that whole rigmarole to get become a citizen so i can get into the navy wow. and when i got in the navy i joined the navy to go see the world and um I got stationed at Litchfield Park in Arizona. <laughs> oh, man. So, so when I was in Litchfield Park, you know, I started skydiving there and I started um, uh, flying airplanes, you know, and that sort of thing. So, yeah, I started flying when I was 17 years old. <laughs> oh, man. What was it about the Navy that uh, you mentioned that there was, um, you know, you, you some of your family uh, had been a Navy veteran Um Forgive me, what, who who in your family was the 30-year Navy vet? My father was Royal Navy, and oh, my okay. step-uncle, he was uh, U.S. Navy. So he salt was, uh, in the veins kind of a thing. Yeah, but I think the uh, the main reason I joined the Navy was just to go see the world. I didn't look at, uh, you know, I one of the things I was looking at is, you know, humping around on the ground is not, mm -hmm. not easy. <laughs> you know, so, but when I was in high school, I was a gymnast. Yeah. So I was in really, really good shape. Wow. So um, if you look at some of those Navy photos I had, you can see I had a pretty barely chest and yeah. I was pretty strong, had big arms. But um, I, what I did is I did 200 sit-ups, 200 push-ups, 200 jumping jacks every morning, oh my uh, God. regardless of where I was. So um, so I joined the Navy just to go see the world, and I got stationed out in Arizona. A year later, I, I did get stationed for the USS Arlington, which was a pre-commissioning detail. It was a brand-new <laughs> ship. It was an old aircraft carrier. And they were putting antennas on the flight deck. Hmm. Um, but it took forever to get commissioned. So I volunteered to go work on tugboats for a while and yard tugs. Mm -hmm. And I loved working on tugboats. Really? And then um, then I worked, I went on the USS Den Denabala, which is a refrigeration ship. And did <laughs> okay. 
Yeah, I did a, a med cruise with them, went to Italy, Spain, and France. Wow. Fell in love with Spain wow. because in about two years I might be moving there. Oh wow! Uh, and so from uh, from there I came back to the states, and they were looking for volunteers to go to Vietnam, and I'm going, hey, what's Vietnam? Where's that? <laughs> this chief, this chief looks at me and he goes, "We're fighting a war in Vietnam." I go, "Oh, really? Cool, I'll go." <laughs> and they said it was shore duty, not on a ship. Yeah. So they they sent me to SEER training and um, and uh, counterinsurgency training and some mm -hmm. other stuff, and then they shipped me off to Da Nang, Vietnam. Yeah. So I stayed there for 22 months, uh, driving trucks, splicing cables, working with. I worked with the CBs while I was over there. Cool. I wasn't a CB. I was just a plain old seaman, but uh, but they were shorthanded, mm. so we just worked with them. Because it doesn't take a you know it doesn't take a brilliant mind to drive a forklift or <laughs> drive a truck. It's just like you drive it. Wow. So uh, I did that, and uh, while I was there, I had a girlfriend, and uh, she taught me how to speak Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. So I had that under my belt. I had a good working knowledge of the language, and uh, then while I was driving, I used to pick up green green berets walking on the street. And I didn't know who they were or anything. Yeah. And then, of course, that song came out, Only Three Out of 100 Make It. And I'm going, oh, that sounds like a great challenge, but that's a bunch of bullpucky. I could do that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so when I came back to the States, I got tired of all the hippies and all that sort of yeah. thing. It, you know, it, I just didn't fit in. So uh, I volunteered to go in the Army and, uh, and volunteered to go for – I took my battery test for Special Forces as a civilian. Hmm. So I, I signed my contract – Four special forces, but if and uh, they had to send me to special forces, and if I failed, then they sent me any place. Probably would have been the 82nd Airborne or something. Yeah. But um, so I went through um, basic in the army, and um, then I went through adva advanced infantry training, and I was the outstanding training at the cycle uh, out of the couple of hundred guys that they run through at that cycle. Mm -hmm. So I, I was the outstanding trainee. I got that little certificate and a little trophy and all that kind of stuff. And from there, I went to jump school, which was a piece of cake because I was already skydiving. <laughs> um, so then, then they sent me to Fort Bragg. I did phase one. Then I went for my MOS training. They sent me into uh, communications, and I had a hard time with that diddy dum dum diddy stuff. So mm -hmm. what I did is I, I told them, I said, look, you're going to lose me. Don't lose me. I said, you know, I worked with the engineers in, in Vietnam. I said, I'm good in mathematics. I said, um, I got a working knowledge of Vietnamese language. So they took me right out of communications, put yeah. me in the next class of engineers. That's pretty so cool. Went, you yeah, so you advocated that. for yourself there. And yeah. you know, that's not easy for a lot of people to do. You know, uh, a lot of people go along with the flow there. Um, but, you know, to just kind of put it straight, like, look, I got some skill sets here and I'm ready to work. You know, um, well, you know I, I was just talking to somebody the other day and I told them, I said, uh, you know, they, they said, what... It was, I, I gave a lecture at, up in Scottsdale the other, uh, last weekend, mm -hmm. and one of them asked me, says, what does it take to do the things that you're doing? How do you, how do you get involved like with the space shuttle program and stuff like that? Yeah. I says, you call them up and ask them what they want. You yeah. ask them what they need, and you learn what they need. Yeah. And once you get that, you just knock on the door and say, hey, I'm here. Yeah. I've got all you're looking for. Let's yeah. go. You know? And that's how I usually did. That's how I did it throughout the whole military. Yeah. There's something there that uh... – you know, aside from um, the history that we're talking about, you know, right there is a lesson that, you know, um, you know, I, I can really sit with and I think I can really learn from. But I think a lot of people can learn from, too, putting yourself out there in a kind and compassionate way, you know, just kind of saying like, hey, I'm here, you know, um, you know, this is my ask. This is what I have. You know, what do you think? Uh, I think I think that's something that a lot of people grapple with doing so. As, as folks are trying to think about how they want to move through life, that's something important to remember. You know, it's, it's think about, think about where you want to go. Think about what you have. And, uh, you know, don't, don't, I wouldn't shy away from asking, you know, it was just kind of asking for, asking for help that got me in touch with you. And I'm very thankful for that. So that's kind of where I'm thinking with that. So. Yeah. I have a, I have a lady friend that she, her and I go hunt meteorites together. And she's a, she's an astronomer and, um, she, um, does these, uh, uh, uh sky parties or star yeah. parties and she has a telescope and, and, uh, she was really worried, really, really worried about doing it, doing a bad job and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I told her, I says, when you go in there, what you do, you set everything up, you're the boss, yeah. you know, everything you just 
just tell them how it is. Yeah. And she didn't, she just went in there and, you know, they had the shut off lights and stuff like that. And, and she got it all done. And she goes, wow. She goes, they paid me more than what I was asking. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the special forces, um, if, if I remember my history correctly, it was founded originally to primarily be, um, you know, training, training soldiers to train indigenous personnel or other personnel um, to, to be able to carry on their own war. So with that kind of vein and thinking, when you're in the special forces, you know, at what point do you come in contact with this idea of like, well, you know, that kind of what you just said there where it's just like, Hey, you know, I'm the boss. I'm, you know, I'm bringing a considerable amount of knowledge here. This is a, an elite force that actually is fostering people with, you know, unique abilities to go out and make a difference. Um, you know, how much of that kind of stuck out to you? And at what point did you really start to feel at home with, you know, the green berets? Um, well, I already had that background of 22 months in Nam and getting shot at and stuff over there. And I had a truck blown off the road from a bomb blast when the enemy dropped a 122 rocket inside the uh, Da Nang Air Base into a bomb storage. Yeah, yeah. And the shockwave blew my truck off the road. But the uh, <laughs> I was going out into a village trying to get people out of the village so they yeah. wouldn't get you know damaged or hurt from it. Uh, but it picked up a five-ton dump truck, picked up over some trees and put it in two-story barracks. That's how bad the blast was. Oh man! And I wasn't that close, you know. But, uh, but this I got is, injured. Well, this is in '66. Uh, yeah, actually, I think it was in '66. Yeah, this is in '66. You guys are getting hit with 120 millimeter rocket attacks in Da Nang. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It, it, it was quite a ways from where I was working at the time. You know, when I was where I was because I stayed right on the beach on the Da Nang River. I just stayed right there, and we had a little shack there. But uh, the rockets mainly hit the Da Nang Air Base. Oh, wow. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, that's a pretty important target right there. And it... But getting back to the original thing, like when when did I – well, I had that background, so I had a little bit of a command presence. And when it first went over, I remember when, when I went over in Special Forces, uh, there was the guys on the airplane. We got out of the plane, and all of a sudden there was some aerial flares going off, mm -hmm. and they could see tracers off in the distance, and they're all freaking out. Mm -hmm. And I told – I had to calm them all down in uh, – and say, hey, look, it, it's not what you think. Mm -hmm. I said, there, there are flares. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. You know, they were just there, and they figured they're going to die or something. It was crazy. Um, so I just calmed them all down. But I think the one of the things is, is like you know, when people ask me what special forces, is, I said, we're teachers. We're trained yeah. to to teach other people how to do how to yeah. fight, and that takes away a lot of the American people that don't have to go in there and fight because now we're teaching the indigenous yeah. people how to do it for themselves. But when the going gets really tough, then the tough get going, you yes. know, and then they said, like in uh, like in SOG, you know, they're all they're all the teachers going out there. Yeah, that's it's prophetic that, um, you know, the 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 Green Berets were, um, you know, for for as you put it, I like how you put it better than I put it, you know, teachers. And, you know, um, as we'll get into you know, you are working in MACV SOG with majority, uh, the majority of the personnel you're in the field with are indigenous personnel. Yeah, they're my, I had a mountain yard team. Yeah. Yeah. I have to ask because I love asking people this. You know, you started touching on it when, <laughs> when, you know, you arrived after, you know, you had 22 months with the Navy um, on your first tour in 66. You're back in, I think, is it 69 that you're showing back up with the Green Berets? 69 um yeah 69 is when i went into sog yeah so you're 69 you're back you know and it might be tough to it might be kind of tough to look back on this but you know you're you're commenting on these guys first impression of stepping off into vietnam i always ask this of people because i'm always fascinated what they say and it's always a little bit different what was your first impression of vietnam the very first time you you set foot on vietnam and can if you remember Damn, it's humid here. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's about that. It. I went over with a bunch of Marines, you know. Yeah. And uh, and I, I remember we were sitting at the Da Nang Air Base. It was like Hill 327 or something like that mm -hmm. over there. 
but we were there at the base of this hill in, in these tents and they didn't ha- they were so short-handed on men back then mm-hmm. that they didn't the marines didn't have all their like their their mess kit you know for eating mm-hmm. and so you know they had like maybe be like 15 of us and we're sharing like maybe five forks five spoons <laughs> five- <laughs> so they take a bite and pass it to the next guy oh, and so it went around like that then one of the other things that i realized is that when you go out, you clean your your tray off, right, yeah. into what's left into a garbage can. And all the Vietnamese were there taking the food out of the garbage oh, cans and hauling off, you know, to go eat it and stuff. And uh, those were little things that I, I remember. Hmm. It's fascinating because um, I, I wish this is okay. This is hard to say, but as somebody who sits with and interviews veterans and really is fascinated with this history. A part of me really wishes I could have seen Vietnam during the war and just for myself perceived just what what the hell was going on. Because, you know, it's like you, even when you're able to have in-depth conversations with people such as yourself, you know, there's there's so much to speak of being able to um, see it for yourself. That's also why I like to ask the detailed questions I do, because I hope, I hope to be able to get people such as myself from the younger generation people who never were there to get an intimation of maybe what it was like and i'm just getting this vivid picture of the vietnamese picking through the trash that's a pretty strong image yeah and then when you're driving down the road i remember a lot of the little huts that people are living in they were made out of um sea ration boxes oh what? you know they fling them flat and they just put them on the post because they didn't have anything <laughs> for siding and, you know, to keep the wind out and oh, stuff, wow. you know. And another thing I used to see a lot of the little hooches made out of was um, uh, like a Coca-Cola cans or 7-Up yeah. cans. And and they were the sheets before mm-hmm. they cut the cans out to, you oh, know. wow. Right. Okay. Yeah, it was just the sheets of nothing. But all you saw was like Coca-Cola, 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 7-Up, <laughs> 7-Up, 7-Up. And it was like, that's how they made them. And they just had all, you know, the that thrash roof or whatever they call it with the yeah. palm branches. Yeah, 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 the interwoven. Um, they didn't have any really big houses. I mean, there was some yeah. places that had big houses, but um, they lived in them because they didn't know how long they were going to be there and they'd have yeah. to move in case the enemy came in or something. Was this because they were like, um, you know, and again, par- pardon me from saying this over and over again, I've read, you were there, but I've only read that, you know, the Vietnamese would set up shop and, and really kind of set up around where the Americans were because, you know, they could trade and they could do services for the military and, and they could become a self-sustaining um, you know, economy, so to speak. Is that kind of what you're talking about? Like here around Da Nang, it, there's just this places. temporary city. Yeah, they would actually live in those places. But yeah, they did. A lot of them would have set up little shops on the outside and have, yeah. you know, soda and stuff like that, or maybe some Bam Bui Bai, you know, the beer, 33 beer. Mm-hmm. Um, they had things like that. I know the, the, some of the stands you go to, I remember you go and you get a lemonade. They would make lemon juice, make lemonade, and they'd have ice in there. And, and I remember looking at my lemonade glass and you see these little little mosquito larvae, you know, going around inside oh. the water. Yeah, so you know, oh. it's protein. But I mean, you, know, you, got, yeah. you got to take the little puppies out of there. And the same thing with the bread. When you get those little skinny loaves of bread that they yeah. used to make and you open them up and they got all these like bow weevils and bugs inside the bread, you know. Oh, my God. Like, yeah, you okay. just get used to it. They're all dead, but it's protein. Okay, I see. Okay. <laughs> all right. Wow. Oh, man. Oh. I live in a sheltered place. <laughs> you know, that's what makes yeah, me think about that. American people have no clue what what it's really like to be like in a yeah. war. Yeah. It is really, it's horrible. It's really horrible for those people. That's part, that's that, that idea right there. That idea that American people have no idea what it's like to be in a war uh, is, is the main driving idea behind um, my, my website and my, my podcast. It's That's like let's talk, let's talk about it. Let's let's think about it and talk about it because war isn't good. <laughs> let's 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 just kind of firmly establish that and just kind of let that let that be known. Um So, all right, so you're back in Vietnam. You've done a tour. You've gotten uh you've gotten some experience under your belt. You, this culture shock and this um reality of on the ground has hit you. And and thank you for sharing the details. It's it's hitting me. Hopefully the listeners are, are getting hit by it as well. But now you're back. And um, I mean, where does your journey begin 
uh, from stepping off the plane with you with your new green beret? Um, I went. I was in uh, Natrang. That's uh, Natrang was where the headquarters for Fifth Special Forces Group was. Um, so uh, I hung out. They sent most of the guys to what they call the COC course, COP course, and it's combat orientation course. Hmm. And they sent them to this little island called the Hontre Island. You get some classroom work, then you go on this island, and they have you running around mm-hmm. in the island and trying to teach you how to walk through the jungle and all kinds of stuff like that. I pretty much had a lot of that already in me, but um, so we did that. And then when I came back. I was sitting in this little bar because I already finished. I was just waiting for orders. Mm-hmm. I went over to this um, master sergeant. It was a or a sergeant major or whatever it was. I went over to him and I said, you know, hey, top, I'd like to get orders to go to Da Nang. And um, he goes, uh, well, I'll see what I can do. Mm-hmm. And so in the meantime, I were, uh, I'm, I'm sitting back at the bar and this guy comes. Well, this, I met another guy who's uh, from India that I knew in Da Nang. He just happened to be in the Trang. And uh, I talked to him and he says, yeah, you don't want to go to Da Nang. He says, it's not like it used to be anymore. Hmm. He says the roads are all shut down. Everything's like that, you know. So I went ahead and was sitting at the bar and this guy walks in and he goes, ah, I'm going home. I go, really? He said, where were you? And he goes, I was at A502, which was an A team just hmm. outside. Eight, it's the largest A team in the world, A502. It had like 50 guys on it versus really? most teams only had 12. Oh, wow. Yeah. And what it was, it was, just, it came directly under headquarters. And it was the uh, security for Natrang. And oh. when you're in Natrang and you look at all the hills, you see all these little outposts out there. Yeah. It, yeah. They had one American on each one of those outposts, huh. except for the Han, which was a mission support site. It was way up on the top of the hill. That is really cool. That yeah. And then really they, cool. those guys had, um, they had uh, two or three guys up there because they were getting yeah. hit all the time. Is that the, like, but, were they working with the civilian uh, irregular defense group guys? Or, yeah, or yeah, they, had, yeah. they had the CIDIG guys defending the Drang? Uh, yeah. Right. Oh, wow. That's and really all cool. camps had a, they usually, they usually had a, a special force, a Vietnamese special forces. Uh-huh. And they had a an American special forces guy. And it was mainly, the American guy was there mainly to, to call in air support and stuff like that uh-huh, because of yeah. the American speaking pilots. Of course, of course. And and my outpost that I was on is way on the other side of those mountains, but the uh, they, when that guy told me about that, he goes, it was really a great duty station. So what I did is I went back down to headquarters and I went. I said, hey, I hear there's an opening at A502, and this guy named Mike Micah, sergeant, he goes, uh, well, if there's an opening at A502, I'm going, and I'm going. <laughs> Oops. Well, damn. <laughs> <laughs> you got snaked. <laughs> so I go back to the bar and I'm sitting there and Micah comes walking in and he goes, hey, Jones, guess what? I go, what? He goes, we're both going to A502. <laughs> so he got both of us. <laughs> cool. So went over to A502 and they put me on this little camp called Suyao, yeah. which is on the other side of those mountains. It was on the other side of what's called the Dongbo Valley. Mm-hmm. And um, it was a, the outpost got overrun. Uh, about, I don't know, probably a couple months before I got there. Was it during Tet? Uh, no, I don't know. I, I don't really know. To be honest with you. I really don't okay. know. Um, but anyway, it got overrun and, uh, on that hill, there was artillery on it uh-huh. and the A the, the team with the Vietnamese, uh, special force CIG was, was down the bottom of the hill. Mm-hmm. And so, um, they got, they got overrun. And a lot of those army guys that, that stayed because they were moving all the artillery out. Mm-hmm. And some of the guys were there and they got, they got, they got hit pretty hard. Mm-hmm. I mean, they, they st- tied the guys to the fences and they started hitting them with machetes and stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was really a nasty thing. So, uh, but after that happened, when I went down there, there was a guy named Bill Hefferman. He was mm-hmm. a staff sergeant. Or, he was a staff sergeant, Bill Hefferman. So I went down and stayed with him because we got hit about every day and a half on that camp. And you, they, they want the new guys to get used to getting shot at and stuff like what is that. This? Is, this, uh, is this artillery or is this like no, person? just a little outpost. What they did is they, when it got overrun, that camp got overrun too, yeah. the, uh, the little camp at the bottom. So what they did is they moved that camp up to the top of the hill after the sure. artillery. And they, they built all new bunkers and everything on it. So what is this VC or is this NVA just probing you guys like every it's, other day? Well, you know, just like we had, uh, like we had, you know, um, uh, Americans with work with the Vietnamese. Yeah. Uh, they had like NVA working with the VC. Okay. And yeah. So th- they'd have a couple of, wow. you know, guys yeah. that were more uh, trained sure. and then they would train these VC and they'd, they'd come and hit places and stuff. So just so the people who are listening, um, just to, just to kind of familiarize the folks who, who, who don't know um, yeah. with, with the terminology here. 
So um, you're with an A team, and what an A team is is what we we're what we were previously talking about with like the core mission of special forces, which is to teach. And the A team is a group of embedded special forces guys, like you said, usually around twelve, and they are out it at a, a a place, and they are training, um, you know, indigenous indigenous troops, and they are working with the indigenous. There's a lot more indigenous than there are the special forces. But they are working with them out there to create a a presence, a, a defensive presence, um, somewhere. So you're you came into Nam and you're like you heard about this work with this A team. You heard you know hey this is pretty good duty, and you know you put the word in. You found yourself out there, and that's just to just quickly bring people up to where we are in case they didn't know what an A team was. Yeah, um, yeah. So like uh, NVA is North Vietnamese Armies. Yeah. And BC is Viet Cong. Yeah. And they're the sympathizers. They had sympathizers outside the VC too, mm -hmm. but you know, people they didn't want to join, but they sided with them. Yeah. Um, and um, oh heck, where was I going? Oh, an A team. Mm -hmm. uh, an A team usually has twelve people on it, and it's it's usually uh, you got two medics, two uh, weapons, two engineers, demo guys, yeah. uh, two operations and intelligence, and two communications guys, yeah. and then two officers. And so they can always split that team in half. Okay. And that team can go off and teach different areas. So Which is cool. Yeah. And unique in terms of military structure. This is pretty right. cool that you got to witness that um, really during the first conflict that it was being tested out in, which is pretty cool. How long were you with the A-team until you started to hear? Because what I hear guys talk about is, you know, they're the, the, the few gentlemen I've worked with who were in SOG, they're in country. And either, you know, I, I you know, Either they're about to leave, they're in special forces, or they're in country, and they just start to hear rumors. They start to hear some rumors, perhaps, about this group of guys somewhere doing something, but it sinks its hooks into them. I'm curious how Mac V. Sog first entered your consciousness, because here you are at the A-team. Well, it I heard about Sog, um, well, we just called the CNC back mm -hmm, then, mm -hmm. but... Um, I heard about it when I was going through phase two of special forces training oh. and it was a guy named Worley and a guy named, um, uh, I think it was Frank was his name. And, um, they got wounded pretty bad and they sent back and they were teaching at, mm -hmm. at the special forces school, you know, at Fort Bragg. Yeah. And, uh, uh, they said, whatever you do, don't go to CNC. And I, I, told, I asked him, I said, why? He goes, you, you go there, you get yourself killed. Yeah. And I'm going, well, thanks. Now I got to go find out. Which is like, yeah, that's like the worst <laughs> thing to tell young guys training to become yeah. Green Berets. It's like, don't do this. It's dangerous. I mean, yeah, well, you like, know, you're, you're joining a group nicknamed the Snake Eaters. It's like, well, what do you think they're going to do? They're going to want to go find that. Yeah. Like, uh, why do I want to be a Green Beret unless there's a war? I'm, you know, I want to go fight for yeah. my country. You know? I don't want to be a green brain and sit back at camp drinking beer and <laughs> listen to everybody else's war stories. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> so, so anyway, so that's where I first heard about it. But uh, some of the guys said, you know, get a little bit of time under your belt with an A-team before, you know, mm. go out in the jungle, walk around a little bit, oh, check it out. Smart. Yeah. And so I did that. And uh, I, I don't even know how long I was there uh, on the A-team. I think I was there probably about, Oh, maybe six or seven months, something oh, like wow. that. Yeah, and then the team, the, the 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 whole thing, the A team turned over to regional popular forces, mm -hmm. and then because they were starting to get rid of a lot of American, trying to bring Americans back to the states. Is this seventy at this point? Is it is it nineteen seventy um, by it, now or late sixty nine? Late sixty nine, yeah, early seventy, I think. That's because yeah, that's like that. yeah. Actually, it had to be in nineteen seventy because I, I think I was at SOG for almost a year, and. Um, and then, then I left in 71, I think, mm -hmm. 71, when I came back. Uh, I was at Long Ton back then. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where they teach special ops. But um, when I was on the A-team, um, I went on down. I stayed with Bill Hef, Hefferman. And, uh, heck, we were getting hit every day and a half. I'd go on the missions. You know, we'd go out and run around the woods and stuff. Yeah. And uh, we'd, I did a lot. I captured a lot of guys when I was there, too. I captured like 15. No, I captured Whoa. maybe about. I think 11 guys enemy when I was there yeah, and whoa, I captured, whoa, whoa, whoa. you've successfully prisoner snatched 15 guys. Yeah. Different, different times. Oh my different, God. That is no easy feat. 
what was your um, technique? What did it you was do? Pretty, it was pretty easy for us, actually. <laughs> it was pretty easy, he says. So what was what was your like go to method? I'm sure you had some tried and true methods for getting guys, because I have read about crazy stuff people did to try to capture prisoners and it wasn't always successful. Well, in Vietnam it's a little different. Sog is really hard. Yeah. But it made in Vietnam. No, nah, I just jumped out of the bush and said, do it, I land out. You know, you know, just put your weapon down, put your hands up. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And you're probably dealing with like what, mainly VC at this point? Yeah, they're mostly VC. Very, a lot of times okay. we would take out the, the hardcore guys. We did, uh, one of the people I captured was a doctor. I captured a doctor one time. I captured a, a nurse and then some more nurse helpers, mm. you know, because they had a hospital up on this one hill. Mm. And we kept having, having guys getting hit. But we couldn't find the, where the enemy were. You know, we couldn't find where they were being treated and stuff. So we knew there was a hospital up there. So I went up with a, a few guys and we went ahead and uh, set up an ambush and we caught them. What kind of weapon were you using? I was using an M16 when okay. I was on the eight. Just a, just a, just a, a, a regular issue. Uh, you know, long twenty-inch triangular handguard M16A1. Yeah, and the uh, the interesting thing about mine is I took you know we, I wore tiger stripes when I was on the 18. Ooh, and, look at uh, you, yeah. <laughs> Adam Hall Taylor, you know. Ooh, look no, at I you, did, got I, your t- tailored yeah. tigers. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I took those tiger stripes and and some of my old ones, you know, I'd cut them up yeah. and I put them on the um, on the grip and on the back end, you know, try to break it up a little bit. You know, I had to have mission, you know, uh, matching. That sick, right? <laughs> <laughs> cool. oh, man. So one time I was up at the mission support site, the one from the Trang, you look up on top of that uh-huh. hill. I was up there and hanging out with those guys for a while. And all of a sudden we got hit by the enemy up there and I'm firing my weapon like crazy. And all of a sudden it caught on fire. No. So the, and the cloth, the cloth I had on there on the barrel, on the hand grip, it caught on fire. <laughs> oh, you madman. Okay, yeah. so I'm like some of the fabric crazy. got on your gas tube and you or on the front uh, right. sight base because those front sight bases get hot. Oh yeah, man, got on fire. <laughs> I never lived that one down, man. They just teased me about that. Oh, man, this man. guy's on fire when he's in a he's in a firefight. <laughs> this guy's on. <laughs> um, that is cool. I uh, I just asked because I I think uh, I uh, I I I just think uh. The little details about the kind of weapons we're using is, or you're using is really cool, and that I could never have guessed that that uh, that story was there. Yeah, so you really <laughs> are on fire. <laughs> Look at you. Yeah. <laughs> you're under fire and you're on fire. <laughs> no, but yeah, we used to, uh, I, when I was on the on that little outpost. I mean, I used to support Recondo School. You know, they were over in the oh, train. Cool. Yeah, yeah, they go out there and they run missions out sure. there and they get themselves in trouble. And I had a four point two mortar. And I'd have put them out there and I'd full, use full charges on that mortar, drop mm-hmm. it down there, you know, the little Swiss cheese on the bottom, just full charges, shoot that puppy out there. And you go, it's not reaching us yet. I'm going, whoa, okay, hold on. And I'd pour a cup of gas down there, oh. then full charges and blow oh. that sucker up. He goes, whoa, that went over our heads. <laughs> <laughs> now, oh my God. So we try to walk it back, maybe a half a cup of gas, you know. <laughs> But you got to be careful doing that That's stuff because you can blow the base out. Yeah. At what point do you overload the capacity of the tube? Oh, man. I don't know. Well, I know in World War II on the um, grenade launchers they had that just fit on the end of your, your, your M1 or your M1 carbine or your Springfield, they had um, they had like little 40 – They lo- it looked like a 45 ACP brass, uh-huh. and they put that in there, and that was like a little booster charge that you could – put in there to help boost that green i've never heard of a gasoline booster charge that really is, i've never oh, heard of a yeah. gasoline booster charge that yeah. is incredible we had a can of gas sitting by the generator and we just yeah. took and just poured that puppy down there bill hefferman taught me that <laughs> so so okay all right so here we are we're at the a team we're doing gasoline booster charges out of a 4.2 mortar we're we're catching our M16 on fire because we're wrapping tigers, <laughs> uh, and and we're capturing like 15 prisoners um, during during your time there. At what point do you get to SOG? Oh well, you know there's still the, uh, I see SOG still... material right here. Like, so when are we going? <laughs> you know, well, you know, on this on this uh, on this mission, I mean, when I was on that camp, that eight that little eight eight team camp there, yeah. Um, 
uh, the enemy tried to overrun us. And uh, I had a really nice fortified camp. What I did is I had the bunkers and I had chain link fence six feet away from the bunkers uh -huh. or maybe 10 feet out away from the bunkers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when they fired an RPG at the bunker, the RPG would hit the chain link fence. It would go off. Yeah. And the only thing hit the bunker would be the motor, the uh -huh. little rocket motor. Oh, man. So, so that helped out a lot. And I had food gas on all the avenues of approach where the enemy could come in because they tried to overrun my camp. Mm -hmm. And when they came through, I blew the food gas, but I didn't know you had to change your food gas every three months or whatever because mm -hmm. it evaporates. Mm -hmm. So when I blew the food gas, they hit me with like about 60 mortars. And then uh, when I blew the food gas, uh, all I got was this big flash of light and white smoke because all the, all the gas evaporated. What's food but gas? But it was enough to scare the enemy away, and they turn around and left. What is food gas? Uh, I have to ask. What is food gas? Oh, it's a it's a jelly gas uh, gasoline. They have this uh, napalm. It's kind of like like a napalm, but na okay. napalm is more intense. You just take this package of stuff. You take a gallon of um, mm -hmm. gas, not a gallon, a fifty five gallon drum, and then you pour all this gel in mm -hmm. there, and you and it mixes it up, makes it gel. Oh man. And at the time, I had some Koreans with me. You know, Korean special uh -huh. forces. The R O K. And they were running missions off of my camp. Mm -hmm. And he came over and he goes, oh, you're doing it all wrong. And I go, what do you mean I'm doing it all wrong? <laughs> he goes, no, you got to put rocks. You got to put glass. You got to put nails. Oh, you got to put everything else in there with it. So, oh, man. And, uh, I said, dude, dude, you're really a morbid dude. <laughs> I've know? heard that the ROK carried a pretty serious reputation in Vietnam. The, uh, uh -huh. the, the Korean guys were like, you didn't mess with them. And they... Especially the Korean special forces. Okay. What was, your, what, what was it like working with those guys? Um, well, they did their own thing. They just used my outpost because it had that little hill and they had antennas on it. Mm. But um, uh, they would dress like the enemy and go out oh. and try to link up with the enemy and walk back in their camps Ooh. and then take them all out. That is bad. Yeah, Ooh. they were pretty hardcore. Um, but uh, the guy got me my Korean jump wings and a Korean ranger certificate and everything, you know. Oh, man. It's downstairs on my wall. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, man. Okay, okay. Well, so, hey, so but, so from there, what I did is um, uh, we were the tamp, the, the team was turning over to regional popular forces. Yeah. And I had, I don't know, probably about 20 something missions there. Yeah. But um, I volunteered to go to CNC mm -hmm. and Gary Stuckey, who uh, was actually a, a ranger guy. He was uh, with the, I think 173rd ranger mm -hmm. or something. Anyway, he, he was working with us on the A team mm -hmm. and um, he, he go, he asked me where I was going. I said, I'm going to go and CNC. And he goes, uh, well, heck, I'll go with you. So he came up to CCC with, with me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, oh, another thing on that A team, uh, when I was there, Frank Miller, Doug Frank Miller, Medal of Honor recipient. Okay. Uh, he, he, he served with us. Wow. Um, he was there with us. And uh, Chuck Hines, that was mm -hmm. later died from a Willie P. Grenade going off in front of him, burned him up pretty bad. And he oh, died geez. a few days later. Uh, he was there with us. And another guy named Carlson was with us. And he was killed at a 502 in an oh. ambush. So, but anyway, so from there, um, I volunteered to go see CCC and we all went down to Vung Tau and partied real hard. And then from there we went, I went up to Contum mm -hmm. and they put me on a, on RT Delaware with Dan Stir, and Dan was the one zero. Mm -hmm. I know to this day, I don't know why Dan was the only man on the team. I don't know if, what happened to them. I need to talk with Dan to find out. Something happened. Because Dan and I still talk to each other. Oh, okay. um, but uh, uh, we went on one mission and it was um, where they, they flew us out. They were supposed to put us in an area over here and we were supposed to walk through a regiment and a battalion. See if I can get my picture here. Through a regiment and a battalion. And what they did is they put us between them. Because mm -hmm. those old French maps, I don't know if you've ever seen them, but they have big spots on them, like white spots, and it's labeled clouds. Oh, so when they were doing aerials... When they're yeah. just like doing aerials because they weren't on the ground. If there were clouds there, that was, it was just, well, you know, we don't know what's there right now. We're making the map anyways. So, yeah, so that's where they put us in. <clears throat> so the enemy let us land. It was a regiment and battalion. They just let us land on the ground. And then they tried to capture us. Hmm. And uh, we ran our butts off for like three, three, three four days. And uh, oh, wow. finally you were, we, you were evading for three days. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they came after us one time with dogs. Um, oh. I mean, they were all over the place. We we're sitting up on a hill, you know, and uh, 
and I'm looking down the next morning and you see him down there and they're banging bamboo and stuff and yeah. trying to walk through, try to scare everybody out. Trying to flush you uh, out like partridges. Yeah. That's uh. what they were trying to do. But, um, we finally got away from him. We got into an area and he says, look, we got to get out of here because they kept telling us to break contact continuation kind of thing. Hmm. And so we blew an avatees. That's where you, mm-hmm. we put a, Dan put a claymore on a tree mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. what it does is instead of blowing the tree off, it just, um, damages the tree so the tree falls over mm. and you, you do you can you can direct it which way you want it to fall. sure so when you got a hill like this and the trees like this what we did is we come up here put the mine on it and it fell over this way mm-hmm. so when it falls over this way then you can get up on that tree run on there and get into a helicopter oh because wow the so thick jeez so, yeah so that's what we did i went out with the first chopper uh with uh two yards and my yards and so then um as we were taking off, they started taking off, and I'm hanging on the strut. <laughs> you know, and I'm going, does anybody see me here? <laughs> Come on, guys. <laughs> so I'm flying off, and I don't know how many feet I'm off the ground, probably two, 300 feet, 400 feet off the ground. Finally, the monyard's yelling at the gunner, trying to tell him to look down. He looks down, and I see these big old eyes, you know? Mm-hmm. Like a, uh, oh, and, shit. And, and, and yeah. big eyes. <laughs> So then they reach down, they, they get on their bellies, they reach down, they grab my arms, and I have to let go. And so they, they got me in. I climbed in, got in there, gave my, my yard a big kiss, said thank you. <laughs> so this is your first mission. With, that was with, my first with, mission. And you're with CCC now. Yeah, I'm with CCC. And then when we got back to Dok Tho, which is our, one of our launch sites to go to Laos, Cambodia, mm-hmm. uh, when I was there, Dan came in the next chopper. And, uh, I mean, he just, uh, I mean, he, he it just... It really affected him, and he said, "You know, because it was it was really a tough mission." Really, but oh um, well, yeah, for three days you guys were being, yeah, hunted. Yeah, he just says, "I just can't do this no more." And so he went to the uh, he went and worked another area in the club mm-hmm. in the compound, and then shortly after that went home. But um, hmm. anyway, so um, uh, the next day, you know, whatever, I'm walking across the compound, and the first sergeant comes over and he goes, he goes, "Hey, Jim, we." Um, he says, uh, we want you to take, how would you like to take over RT Delaware? Hmm. I go, I've only been on one mission. Yeah. You know, and I was, a, I was, a, I was assistant team leader and he goes, well, we think we feel you're ready. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and just a couple of years ago, I was talking to Dan and he goes, yeah, I recommended you to be the team leader. <laughs> Dan. <laughs> thanks. Goes, thanks buddy. <laughs> thanks, buddy. <laughs> so, you know, when did you sign the, uh, non-disclosure form? Oh, that's when you first go in. You yeah. go into a room, you take off all your ID stuff. They take your ID tags, your yeah. car, ID card, everything. They take everything away from you. And you're sitting in there with a T-shirt, and they tell you a little bit about what's going on. Mm-hmm. And then you have to um, come up with uh, – y- they give you a decision. You want to stay here or do you want to leave? Mm-hmm. You have to let us know now. And if you want to leave, no, no, nothing – nobody will look down on you or anything else. You can just go. So um, Gary and I – I think one guy got up and left. Yeah. But anyway, so we went ahead and uh, stayed there. Wow. And um, and then after I was the team leader on that team, they sent me to One Zero School. To, okay, to so you went straight to One Zero School. Yeah, right after the first cool. mission. So, you you know, and, you're really, um, you know, I, I hate, I, I kind of hate to say it, but I can see why you, um, I can see why you had some serious qualifications that you were bringing to to spike team delaware and why you know people thought you were ready you know you you were you you're on your second tour you'd been you'd been playing around <laughs> playing around uh in country for quite a time and doing some pretty cool stuff and uh you you'd been you'd been to the one zero school for what it's worth i can kind of understand why they thought all right we need people and hey jim's got it I can kind of see now where it's where that came from, but I'm sure it wasn't that well received because you're because you know you just run one mission and, and that was a pretty traumatic one. It sounds like it's pretty intense. Yeah, well, we had another guy in the team called. Um, let me see. It was a dancer. Myself was a one one. We had Gary Harned. Uh, he was the one two, and Gary was killed with uh, RT uh, Pennsylvania, mm-hmm. and the whole team got wiped out mm-hmm. uh, on his next mission. What and, happened uh, there? What 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 do you know happened there? Well, actually, I do know what happened. But um, what happened? They they said the chopper got hit with an RP, RPG and it got uh, blown out of the sky or something. 
Um, yeah, that's the vulnerable. That's a really vulnerable time. I've heard is that everybody's yeah. on the chopper. Were they coming in on? I I don't know um, if out. you know the details. They're coming out. Yeah. Oh no. Yeah, they got chased oh. by one of those uh, Russian teams uh, that where they yeah. they had these uh, uh, hunter killer teams oh, no. together with some Russian guys, and uh, apparently, you know, they they forced the North Vietnamese to do their job. So they put them in very vulnerable areas, and um, apparently, when the chopper was coming out, they they were probably up on this hill, you know, because it was like a hill like so, mm -hmm. and they just, you know, can you? I guess you can see it. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Uh, they got this hill like this, and they, they fired down and hit the chopper. So what? So um, the podcast is on YouTube, and it's also I put it out on Spotify for audio. So um, what Jim is showing is he's showing kind of like a V. And the chopper was below the height of one of the peaks of the yeah. valley that they were in, and the and the RPG came down from an angle and got them. That's terrible. Um, yeah. I I get shivers when I honestly sit with the idea of a highly trained hunter killer group coming for me, and I can't imagine what it's like to 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 run. Uh, recon with SOG. So again, ha being able to talk with you is, is, is hopefully helping people understand this kind of duty. And, uh, when folks, um, why, why SOG had such a high casualty rate. Um, and hopefully we can all appreciate, um, what these men did and under, and, you know, really be thankful for their sacrifice and the ultimate sacrifice. Um, it sounds like in terms of this whole, whole team, was that Pennsylvania you said? Yeah, it was RT Pennsylvania. Oh. It was uh, Lieutenant Poole and some other guy and Gary Harned. I think they had four Americans. Maybe I know they had three, but they might have had four. I you know, remember. and your prowess as a recon, you know, if you could you could be you could be the you know, the greatest recon team on the ground and then you're there in the chopper and you know, it just so happens that you know, it's when you're 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 most vulnerable in a way is right then and there, and that's just terrible. Yeah, going out and coming in is the worst time. Dick Thompson said that um, the most anxious time for him was when he was going in, and then as soon as he got into the jungle and he had control, you know, that was like okay, time to get in rhythm, time to listen, time to start moving, time to start making my decisions. But he said, you know, he really had to focus on some like deep breathing really working on that because that was when it was, that's when it was most anxious for him. When was the most anxious time for you during a mission? Um, usually it's going in and when you're on the ground, your ears are plugged because you're coming in from a high altitude coming oh, in. Oh, right. And you can't really hear that well. Cause you and auto then, rotate in sometimes to get down yeah. to the ground really fast. Yeah. And, uh, King bees were good for that. Uh, the, uh, those are the H-34s yeah. of Vietnamese. Too. Um, but the uh, as soon as you're on the ground and you're waiting for that next chopper to come in, you're making sure there's nobody around yeah. uh, the best you can. And then the next chopper comes in, drops the rest of the team off. And what you do is you just move off to the side and just wait because you got all these sticks and everything falling down from yes. when it's from the prop yes. wash, from the you know the rotor wash. Um, and then you're waiting for your ears to unplug. Mm -hmm. And then from there you move off to a safe area. You sit down and you just kind of, what I did is I'd lean up again, you know, sit back against a tree. I just close my eyes and listen. Right. And try to hear, you know, birds, uh, bugs, uh, water, anything I can hear. Wow. And just, you know, movement, anything, you know, and it, if you have your eyes closed, you can hear much better. Hmm. So I would do that, not, not for a long time, but just long enough to get grasp of what's going on. Then from there, you move on out and do your mission. Wow. So... Um, I try to keep things, I try to th keep things pretty chronological, um, as we kind of move through, uh, the podcast. So what I want to do here is just kind of like, I can't wait to start getting into some of the, the missions, the, the, the individual missions, but I really have to come back to this three, four day first mission you ran. Um, you know, I have never been hunted with dogs. I've never been hunted by people. If if you're if you're if you're willing and able, would you be able to take, you know, myself and the audience kind of along with you on the experience of being hunted and tracked 
by people with dogs um, for days. Well, we just had the one day where we saw the dogs. Uh, but for the most part, the um, you just you're, you're, you see them going by. You can see them. They're, they're trying to come up to you. You can hear them talking because they're a large group. They're just going to yell to each other. You can mm -hmm. hear them. And they're just, you just try to keep away from them. You try to, you just, you know, you, it's, I don't know how to put it. You just try to keep away from them yeah. and try to get out. And you just try to convince the, uh, the main camp, you know, CCC to commander to come and get you out of there. But, you know, uh, they just, um, you know, we didn't get any, we didn't, I don't, I don't think, no, we I don't think we got any firefights with that on that mission. Good. We just tried. Wow. Yeah. Just, yeah. Just try to get away. There you just, go. Yeah. Just try to get away from these guys. And so we finally did. Wow. So and, uh, were they so most, it, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. It's just, uh, you know, just trying to get away from, them. just try to keep quiet, try to keep hidden and you'll see them walking around, you know, and hopefully they just don't see you. When, what were the nights like? Um, well, we would, we would take a tree on a hill, you know, like this, you know, you get a, you get a hill and mm -hmm. you got this tree growing up, up like this. Mm -hmm. And what you do is you straddle the tree, you get them really a steep, really a steep hill. Yeah. And then you just straddle it and just try to sleep right there. Okay. So you're le So, so for the people listening, um, you're on a steep hill and you got a tree that's going straight from the st steep hill. So it's creating, you know, you know, you, you got kind of like a little bit of an angle there. And you're in what you're saying by straddling is you just put your legs on either side of the tree and you just lean forward yeah. against the tree because there's only one yeah. way they can come at you. Right. Is, is this from down below you? Yeah. It, at night, they're not going to be able to walk around that area. You know, they'll, mm. they'll fall or something, you know? Okay. So it's, they're, that, they cool down at night. Yeah. They'll, they, you know, they'll, they'll sit there and put up little perimeters and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, they know, they usually have an idea how many is on the ground too. They, they knew more about us than, than what we probably figured. Yeah. I mean, we had teams go in one time. We had one team go in and, and he gets on the ground. He goes walking over to the trees and a NVA captain comes walking around the corner and says, Sergeant so-and-so get on your chopper, call your choppers, get on them and go. Actually told him to leave instead of fighting him. When now, when was that? Um, that I, I think that was in Laos, but uh, mm -hmm. what well, I think what they were trying to do is they were uh, they didn't want because if there was going to be a big conflict going on, a big battle, then they they whatever whatever they were doing is going to be compromised. Battle is bad for business, yeah. So, what they did is they just called this killed the guy, called him by his name, yeah, called him by his name, said, Sergeant so and so, get on that helicopter and leave. I know that there and were leaks in Saigon, he goes, don't ask me, just come back and get us. Uh. I knew that there was. I knew that there were leaks in Saigon. Um, Tilts talked about that, and and a couple of books I've read have talked about that. And I know that there are even you know, camp level leaks of 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 um, Vietnamese folks who are working in the camp, who were collaborating with with uh, um, the VC network all the way out to the NVA um, command and control centers. So I know that is because you're running recon here in 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 sixty nine seventy. And I think you're, I think you're so far on the podcast, um, you're, you are like the latest, so to speak, like the, the latest guy doing, doing running recon. And from what I've been able to gather is it's like, you know, as the war went on, the NVA got better and better at tracking down SOG teams. It got more and more dangerous. And then um, there were more and more leaks because they were focusing in and trying to get that information. So that's an incredible story right there. Wow. Yeah, we had another group that went in one time, and um, when they walked, were walking off the LZ, it had a sign that says, Sergeant So-and-So, welcome to LZ number one. Welcome to LZ number two kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. Jeez. Okay. When you see stuff like that, it kind of works on your head. Oh, yeah. That's great psyops yeah. right there. Where are these guys? Are we going to be dead in about a second? <laughs> so you know, we lost... There was there was like twenty five of us and actually running these missions in, mm. in CCC, and uh, some of the teams we had never went out in the field mm. because they didn't have one zeros. They didn't have team leaders, mm. so they just stayed there. They just lay on the berm, do berm duty, guard duty at night, stuff like that. Just kick mm. back, get a suntan. But there was it was pretty much the same teams that were going out all the time, and um, the um, uh, we lost like about five guys a week, mm. wounded, killed, or captured. You know, so we, we had 135% casualties being 
killed or uh, captured or wounded more than once. That's that's remarkable, remarkable levels of attrition. Um, yeah, and crazy. and then it did just kind of keep into con. I, I mean, just to kind of keep in context here. People know. I mean, you know when the whole the whole organization knows when people um, are lost, when people um, get killed, uh, wounded, and and have to rotate out. And people know it's no secret that you guys have this attrition rate, and yet you're still doing it. There's a job to do. So yeah, I got a. I, I I'm very curious. So you've gone on your first mission, and and as you know a little bit about me, um, I'm very interested in in. Uh, what are now artifacts, but were at the time, um, you know, were tools of the trade. What was your, what was your, uh, um, cross border kit and how did you set it up and how did it change over time? Well, I don't know where that word kit came from, but, uh, we, I just called it my web gear. Yeah. Um, I, I had a, it was just a, a regular, like a, an H harness. Mm hmm and it was a, it was a, it had a clamps on top. So when you come out on the stable rigs, you can actually hook up and they just fly off with you. Mm -hmm. um, I did that a lot on my bottom part, my straps that go underneath your legs. Mm -hmm. What I did is I put, um, I put pads on them mm -hmm. and I wore them on the outside of my legs okay. and, you know, and most guys just taped them up and put, cause a lot of guys didn't like riding strings. I loved it. Mm. So, um, I did that. Um, I had magazine pouches around. And I, I can't remember how many magazines I had in each pouch. So 20 round magazines. I think I had six in each pouch. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was six, either five or six in each pouch. Because you can put other magazines on top of them. Is this a canteen, they, like a canteen, canteen pouch? pouch? Okay, cool. Yeah. yeah, you can put them in there and then you can lay a couple of magazines on mm -hmm. top and then snap goes snaps on there. <laughs> um, yeah. So And then I had a 30 rounder magazine in my my oh. rifle that Johnny Plaster bought for us. He got, oh. we all, he got an order in. So yeah. we did all chipped in he got a whole bunch from over he couldn't get that many of them yeah. but he got enough that everybody got one he wrote right to colt didn't he he like wrote directly to colt to get those 30s he might have i don't know i thought he went to some jobber or something or some you know some warehouse and, and just contacted him i can't john remember was a cool guy. i uh so man you served with john plaster yeah served with bob howard john plaster uh you uh, served with bob howard Oprah. Yeah, Bob Howard. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Oh. For folks yeah, who don't Bob. know who Bob Howard is, uh, it's Google time. Um, the podcast can come back. You can come back to the podcast, but I, please Google who Bob Howard was. He was a Medal of Honor winner, right? Yeah, he 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 was put in for the Medal of Honor three times, and you're only allowed one, so he just got the one. He received this the one Medal of Honor. Yeah. I think he had a one or two DSCs, Distinguished yeah. Service Cross. And they're silver stars, bronze stars. He had nine purple hearts. He was wounded over a hundred times. Oh man, you served with heroes. That is cool. Yeah, I'm very fortunate like that. And John Plaster and, and too. Frank Miller, you know Frank Miller. I knew Frank and um, on the A team and uh, at ACC. Well, John Plaster was like, uh, you know, when I was, f I want to say I was like 12, 13, and I had my weekly allowance. I went to the local bookstore, which is, you know, Powell's Books here in, in Portland. And uh, I saw this book and it, and it said, SOG, America's Secret Commandos in Vietnam. And I was like, oh, great. How much money is it? And it was $7, which was my allowance. I bought it. And that was the first book I ever read about SOG. And ever since then, I've just kept reading them all. And, and, and it was John Blaster who first wrote that book. And, and he did a great service um, putting that out there because I, I met another, a, a number of other people who that was their introduction to the Secret War. Um, so, so John Plaster, I think his code name was plastic man. I don't know yeah. if that was before or after he started writing Covey, but I, uh, I would love to get John Plaster on the podcast, but, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see. We'll get there one day. Maybe. Yeah. He's a really nice guy. Johnny's a good guy. So you're, you're setting up your web gear, um, and your uniform. Um, I've seen a picture of you holding up your, your camouflaged, uh, cross border uniform, when did you put that together? Were you were you well, running that from the beginning, or did you kind of have normal jungles that you eventually realized you wanted to customize? When did that happen? Well, when we take when we get our jungle fatigues, what we do is we just make them up the way we want to. Yeah. But uh, all the everything, all the labels, everything have to come out of the uniform. Yes. We can't have anything on you that says you're American. Yes. Um, so what I did is I took the like I said the big pockets on the bottom of the the top you know, shirt. 
put them up on top, took the small pockets off, put them on my mm-hmm. shoulders. And uh, that way I could tuck it in. And then the regular pants, I just put them on. And I would uh, use a cravat to tie it tight and put my shirt in my pants and just tie it tight. Okay. And then uh, I'd, I'd tape my my pants onto my boots so leeches and stuff couldn't get in. Mm-hmm. And and that was about it. That was pretty much it. And then on the on my web gear you know, with the magazines, I had the I carried about 30, 35 magazines, something like that. Um, I carried that car 15, the little, little sawed off M16. Yeah. Uh, I did, uh, I carried, um, an M79 that was about yay big. It was all cut off. Ooh, Back nice. end was cut off. Car was yeah. cut off. And I had, um, oh, I don't know, probably about six or so of, uh, rounds, Ford HE rounds in it. Um, see what else did I have? I carried a pistol on my, on a cord here. Hmm. It was a cat house pistol. What's it was that? a little 32, it was a little Colt 32. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's a cat, you know, a cat house when you go downtown because we wore civilian clothes every time. When we left the base, we wore civilian clothes. Okay, I'm understanding now. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I had okay. That. yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I gave that to my mine yard when I left. Oh, cool. Uh, the one zero or zero one. Yeah. Uh, let me see. What else did I have in my web gear? I had my knife and I had uh, smoke. I had smoke. Usually, I carried the smoke in the back end. I didn't like carrying white white phosphorus. That's I didn't like terrifying. Yeah, it's that scary stuff. So I, I don't think I even carried one. I when I was in Vietnam, I carried one because it's great for marking mm-hmm. your location. It's better it's than so white hot. Smoke. It's so it, they burn. For people who don't know, uh, white phosphorus, um, it burns like five thousand degrees, and yeah, it, it, really it what it does is it eats through anything, including flesh. Um, try to wipe it off. You just smear it. Um, it's terrible stuff. But it's so hot, it creates a vapor plume that sends the smoke a lot higher than your regular smoke grenade. So, um, okay. I understand. Yeah. If one of those, I mean, if bullets are zipping through and a bullet clips, one of those things, white pee, it burns on contact with oxygen. So, I mean, you know, you don't have to pull the pin on that thing to have it go off on you. If it gets hit, I mean, if you, if a regular smoke grenade gets hit, I mean, it's just going to spill some smoke powder around, but okay, cool. Yeah. We used to take the smoke grenade uh, fuses out and put them in the regular grenade. Wait a yeah, second. You drop them on the ground. I've 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 popped. Uh, I you know every now and then I find. You have um, to modify it. Okay, okay. I'm because I've popped M18 smoke grenade fuses because I don't like having live smoke grenades in my household. I collect old smoke grenades and stuff, and I even have a demilled white pea grenade that a friend of mine uh, procured, and that was an interesting. It's it's not live, thank God, but I don't like having live stuff. Um, so I mean, I've popped those fuses, and I mean they're pretty much instantaneous. Exactly. The M eighteen. So you, but 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 but, 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 but hold up. So you're. This is an HE grenade, though. So what yeah. are you doing to lengthen that fuse so you don't blow your hand off, or worse? No, what you, you know, what you do is you just put it in the grenade and drop the grenade along the trail. Oh, it's oh, it's like an eldest <laughs> son thing. Okay, yeah. so you're, you're. Oh, I understand. It's yeah, supposed so to blow your go, hand off, just not your hand. The whoever exactly. finds it. Oh, free yeah, grenade! It's gonna go off right away. Oh, that is sick. Yeah, ATF, uh, the Bureau of Firearms and Tobacco. Um, they, uh, I think they classified the uh, those fuses as you're not supposed to own them. So whenever I find one at a gun show or something, I I, I deactivate it. Anyways, um, maybe I'll edit that out of the podcast. Regardless. Uh, that is some interesting, interesting stuff that you uh, were doing. Oh man! They, they, they put uh, C four in some of the rounds too. That you know, so yeah. when they put them in the weapons, it would blow up the weapon. We had a guy on the show. Um, oh, his father was uh, unfortunately um, was was killed doing an ammo plant mission, um, and uh, they were they were supposed to bring in ammo like that. So, uh, and that was eldest son, right? That program that was planting yeah, and doing psyops and stuff. There was a lot of names. I, I, I don't remember a lot of the names and stuff, you know, I uh, soap chips and all this kind of stuff, but, uh, I just had all the little pamphlets. I dropped them along the trails and stuff. And I, and I don't remember a lot of the names for a lot of that stuff. You know, I mean, when I was going to, you know, I guess we had like Prairie fire, I think they called that Laos or something or, mm-hmm. But also prairie fires mean you're in a prairie fire, prairie fire, you're in an emergency. Right, you're right. You get a team out. 
so yeah there's a lot of names that they were all kind of fouled up and i yeah. i never paid attention to a lot of that stuff sure. i just i just did the mission sure. they told me where to go i just got in the plane gone you know i just went you I, know um how many missions did you end up running with sog uh seven or eight missions with sog Ooh, i didn't okay. have that many missions with them that's but a few three of my missions were bright lights okay so when was you know you went on your first mission that you know we talked about um what was the second one you ran i boy i can't remember if it was uh because i did have a one or two missions that were dry holes i think i had one mission that was a dry hole we went in and walked around for five days came back out and i was at nothing mm -hmm. nothing to see i uh, didn't see the enemy or anything and then um uh i had one where we went in and uh we had um we gotten we were walking through we were doing a linear recon and i remember we got down close we took down started to take a break and all of a sudden the enemy just started walking right by us on a trail oh my god and um we didn't know the trail was there i was only like four feet away from the trail hmm. but you know the, the the jungle was so thick you know i just couldn't see the trail and i thought that i thought the enemy were going to see us but they did they just you know, guys be walking through, you know, have their weapon over the shoulder and they just bebop through because it's like Laos or Cambodia. Yeah. They don't expect to get hit, you know. So and our job wasn't to go in there and kick butt. Our job was to go in there and gather intel. Mm -hmm. So they just bebop right on through. I think that's an important distinction to make because uh, SOG was primarily clandestine recon. And, right. you know, you had to be able to survive to get out with the intelligence. So that's why SOG teams um, were inherently really well trained and really well armed. But your primary function was to get in and get out with the information. Right. That, that was the main thing. Um, yeah, our job wasn't to go in and shoot them up. We had teams like that. Some of the spike teams were like that. Ed Wolkoff had a team like that. Um, and and then you had guys like, you know, Frank Miller. We got in and he just shot up everything. You know, he, just, <laughs> <but> <laughs> he was he was your, uh, uh, what do you want to call him? Rambo. He was your real Rambo. Oh, man. Yeah. Oh, man. And you had guys like Bob, Bob Howard, you know, Bob yeah. was, um, you know, he was just, a, he was a real gentleman. He was mm -hmm. like a Southern gentleman, just a, a great guy. And um, I mean, he tried to capture everybody alive, but he'd get so much adrenaline set up. He'd hit him too hard. <laughs> and oh, no. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh, but it's just funny yeah. to hear that. Oh my God. Yeah. But he was, he was really a nice guy. Mm -hmm. I mean, just a real gentleman. Mm. Um, very military oriented just uh he loved the military mm -hmm. he loved his job and he did it very very well mm -hmm. and i i don't think he had like arms and legs with muscle in him i think that was just all guts guts because uh. that guy had he had guts of steel oh my god <laughs> he had nerves like you wouldn't believe and that guy would do anything let's tell a bob howard right. story let because because unfortunately i don't think bob howard's with us anymore I think, no, I think he's passed away. He passed away. Yeah. But you served with him, so who better to tell a Bob Howard story? You pick. You know, probably the best guy would be Johnny Plaster. Well, well. Oh boy. Yeah, you know, because uh, when I when I uh, was talking with Bob Howard, he was gone when I got there. Mm. He was um, he was going he was going to receive his medal, and so when he came back, I remember walking into like the clubhouse. And this guy looks over and he looks at me and he goes, Jones, he goes, you're Jim Jones, aren't you? And I just kind of walked forward and I looked at his name tag and I go, Howard, ah, oh, you're Bob Howard, aren't you? <laughs> like that. And we sat down, we, he, he, I don't think he drank over there. I think he, I don't know if he ever drank, but I think he was having a soda and I was, I got a beer and I was talking to him for the life of me. I can't remember what we really even talked about, but um, some Colonel came in and wanted to talk to him and it took him away from me. And that was actually my only real time of really talking mm. with Bob, you know, you know, side by side with him like that. Wow. But the um, uh, all the stories and stuff, you know, the stories before he got his medal mm -hmm. is uh, a phenomenal. Like, um, I think he went in on a bright light to go get Joe Walker out. Mm -hmm. And Joe Walker, we just lost Joe Walker, too. Mm -hmm. uh, Joe Walker was quite a quite a man. He was like he was like Johnny Plaster. He, mm -hmm. he was an excellent soldier. So what happened with that mission there where, where, where Howard went in to get him? Out? They went in at night. Uh, they went oh, in and wow. they found each other at night and got him out of there. Oh, wow. So, but they were all wounded and everything. And, uh, but, uh, yeah, Bob Howard was uh, just one, one hell of a great soldier.
Unbelievable, mm-hmm. man. He's the most highly and most decorated soldier in Vietnam. Legend. He's just yeah, a legend. legend. But you know, when he was um when he was gonna retire, he had a he was he was gonna put on his beret and they you know, he wasn't in special forces at the time. He was the commander of a post or something. And so uh they told him to uh, says, No, you can't wear your beret. And he goes, Well, I'm wearing my beret. He goes, You're not gonna we're not gonna give you your you know, whatever. Uh, on the parade field, if, unless you're, if you're wearing your beret. And he just looked at him and just said, you know, you know my mailing address. I'll see you later. He just left. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I oh mean, he was God. really a good guy. Great guy. But I've talked to guys that saw him, you know, like when he was uh, working uh, with, you know, with leg troops and stuff. And and um, the one guy walked into into this barracks and Bob turned around. He didn't have a shirt on, and he was just nothing but scars. Hmm. He he was on the ground, and there was a um, you know how your back kind of comes down, dips yeah. in where your spine is. He was laying as tight as he could to the ground, and the machine gun went right over his back. Oh. Yeah, I mean he he was he was got torn up pretty bad. Hmm. But he was one of those guys. Like uh, there was one story where he uh, he got hit with a flamethrower. He hit the ground, and when he got back up again, he saw the guy there. There was a guy there with a a gun. And um, he, uh, Bob got up and pulled out his pistol and the guy pulled the trigger, the enemy, and the gun didn't go off. Hmm. And Bob just told him to go. <laughs> told him to go. And they said, why'd you let him go? He says, I can't shoot an unarmed man. Oh, wow. That's how Bob was. Oh, man. Listening to stories like that makes me go just like, yeah. Ooh. Yeah, but Johnny, Johnny Plaster knew him really well. So, oh, We'll try it. We'll try, I'll try Walker, to would, get a hold you of John would have loved Joe Walker. Joe Walker was a great guy. Yeah. I mean, he was great. Uh, he took over Delaware for our mission one mm-hmm. time when I was down teaching. Mm-hmm. But um, I when talked did, to Joe did, a couple of years, about three or four years ago, yeah. and uh, he didn't remember. He didn't oh. remember ever taking Delaware. When did he pass? Uh, just last year, just a few oh. months ago. And Bob, uh, Howard, Bob Howard had pancreatic cancer. Yeah, and oh, he man. passed. And then uh, uh, Doug Miller, same thing. You know, Dougie got pancreatic cancer and passed. I was going to interview uh, Doug Doug Miller. You know, Frank, but he uh, he got so busy. He only went to SAR one time, mm-hmm. and he got so busy. There were people asking him questions. I couldn't mm-hmm. interview him. And so, because I had, I do a lot of interviews as well. Really? On, yeah, with VHS, SVHS, the old cameras. I used to do it with those back oh, in the wow. day. I've got uh, Billy Waugh. I got Billy Waugh on there. Really? And uh, I think, in fact, I got Johnny Plaster too. Thank you for doing that. Yeah. And um, yeah, I've, I'm, I'm getting ready to put them over to like something DVDs or something. And uh, yeah. as soon as I get to everything's in boxes right now, yeah, yeah, I'm still yeah. building my downstairs. Okay. So, yeah. But uh, I'll probably give them to the archives and stuff like that. Or if anybody yeah. ever wants use them they can well you I know, did, uh, my immediate thought is you know and and we can talk about this after after air is like get you set up with a youtube channel and get you set up do. because what because the one of the, the the big pleasure of what i do here is that it's free for everybody you you can be anybody and you can come on and you can listen to the podcast and you could learn so my first idea is like we need to get <laughs> we need to get a bones jones uh youtube channel and we need to digitize all of this stuff so that people can hear these legends who are unfortunately no longer with us. Yeah, I just we just lost Singlob too. I know. Uh, I almost got him on the show. Yeah, I, I interviewed him. him. Oh, you interviewed Jack Singlob. I, but you know I, what? He's down in the corner. He's like down in the corner here because I had my camera set up and I just got done interviewing Johnny Plaster. And Johnny screwed around with my cameras, oh, and I figured everything was set up. So I go ahead and I go down over there, and I'm I'm talking to you know General Singlob, and next thing you know, I'm I'm going back and looking at it, and he's down this corner down here. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh no! But uh, I used to work for a, a video company in town, mm-hmm. in uh, not not I live in Bisbee, Arizona, on the border, mm-hmm. but uh, uh, when I was in Tucson, I used to work for a, a TV station. And they put you for all these trainings to how to how to film, how to edit, mm-hmm. all this stuff. But it was the old uh, SVHS stuff, you know. Yeah. And um, anyway, the uh, they would let me use the cameras. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I do stuff you know, like field field 
video and stuff and i'd let them have that and then i'd use the cameras for my own stuff oh cool that is yeah, cool not bad equipment back in the day well we're gonna have <laughs> if you ever need any help if you need any but any support i'd be happy to um help you get that stuff out um let's move back here uh, you know while we got the time we have here to you know, you're running recon. You, you said you ran a couple dry hole or you ran at least one dry hole mission. You know, here you are and you're doing it. You're, you're the, you're the one zero, um, in, of Delaware, right? Right. Archie so you're the Delaware. one zero of Delaware. You're getting missions under your belt. You know, I would love to go through every single mission, but I'm just going to ask, you know, what was the next chronologically speaking? What was the next mission that really sticks out for you as well, one that's notable of going through here? Yeah, we had a, a rough mission when I was with Delaware. Uh, I decided to just give my guys a week off. Mm -hmm. So I gave them a week off, and I'm walking across the compound. And then uh, the first sergeant comes over, and he goes, uh, he goes, Jones, he says, your team's down, right? And I go, yeah, I gave him a week off. <laughs> and he goes, uh, you know, RT Illinois. Uh, no, no, that was, that was another. But uh, anyway, it was the same type of thing. He asked me, he goes, do you want to run with our RT Illinois? He goes, their team, team leader is on leave. Mm -hmm. And he says, we need a bright light team up at, uh, up in, uh, Doc to. So what I did is, uh, it, Steve Kiever was the one zero of that team. So what I did is, uh, I said, sure. So I went over and talked to the team and everything. And we took off and we went up to Doc to and we're waiting for bright lights. That's when a team gets in trouble. Yeah. You know, if a team in the field gets in trouble, gets hit with a large enemy force yeah. or they have bodies left behind or whatever, they, they sent a bright light team in. Mm -hmm. to either give them support or help get them out of there or to get bodies and retrieve bodies out and stuff like that. So anyway, we had a bright light come up and I talked to him about it and the team got out. Okay. They lost a man. Uh, well, they lost one man on the ground in a firefight. The other, um, then they didn't get that body, but it was two, there was like probably two, 300 enemy there. So we couldn't get into it. Yeah. The, um, but one of the guys was coming out on ropes and the rope broke mm -hmm. and uh, he fell to his death. So a Cobra gunship saw the rope in a tree. And so uh, I talked to him and I go, how far away is it? He goes, probably about four, 400 meters from, from where, where, where they came out. Mm -hmm. And he fell to his death. So I said, how many enemy? And they go, we estimate probably about 250, 350 enemy on the ground. So I said, I don't have time for two helicopters. I says, what I want to do is I'm just going to take two other guys myself. We're going to repel in and come out on ropes. Mm. And um, so at that time, Steve Kiever, who was the Teams 1-0, he comes bebopping up. They came up in some H-34s or something. And he comes over and he, he goes, I goes, Steve, what are you doing here? And he goes, um, I just got off a of leave. And I'm mm. going, well, uh, we got a bright light. You want to go? And what's he going to say? <laughs> It's his team. He can't say, oh, no, I don't want to go. You get killed in those things. <laughs> yeah. So I could just see his little wheels turning, and I go, you want to take over the team? He goes, no, you've already been briefed. You take it. So I went as the 1-0, and Steve went as the 1-1, and his 1-1 went as the 1-2. So we flew in, rappelled in. Then we couldn't even get on the ground because of triple canopy. Couldn't get on the ground, so the chopper – just came right down through the tree, started mowing everything down, oh. took all the skin off the bottom of the rotor. What kind of chopper is this? Is this, huh? a, is this a Huey or a King Bee? It was a Huey. Okay, so it was a Huey. All right. Yeah, so we, we finally got on the ground, and uh, we had to kind of climb up a hill a little bit so we could get a little bit closer. And so we unhooked, and we started walking up to the hill, and this cobra comes over, and he goes, hey, Carrot, follow. Because, you know, my code name was the Wild Carrot. So he says, hey, Carrot, follow me. So I'm walking up this hill and I see the rope in the tree. Mm -hmm. And so we get up in there and we start digging the guy up out of the ground and stuff. And we hook his body up, hook uh, the other guys up. They hook me up. And I said, okay, get us out of here. So there, and we can hear the enemy yelling and coming up the oh, hill because they, they'll yell, you know, they'll yell and everything else. You know? So anyway, that chopper is coming up and we're getting up through the tree. And as I can see down through the trees, I could, I could see the enemy and they're all shooting at the helicopter. Mm. So, um, Anyway, I got I, our guys, we were sitting there shooting back down at the bad guys as we're coming up. You can hear the bullets whizzing by us, but none of us got hit or anything. And as we got up a little bit higher, we got about maybe three, 400 feet off the ground or something like that, off the top of the trees. Mm -hmm. And this A1E Sky Raider came right underneath me <laughs> like that. And the pilot just, you know, went like just looked at me <laughs> like that, you know. It's like, so that's the wild carrot. You know? Oh, my God. <laughs> he threw you the, so, he gave you a little tip of the hat. 
Yeah, he did. I mean, you you could you could just see him right there. He was only like fifty feet underneath me. Oh my god! And he was flying. Um, he was he was firing uh, uh, you know nails, uh, you know flechettes, mm-hmm. and firing uh, rockets and stuff down at the bad guys. But you could see the everything right. Underneath. You know, you see it where it left the because he he shot it and then waved at us actually because he was like we're mm-hmm. here, the enemy's here over here. You see, I get this, mm-hmm. and he's over here somewhere, and he's coming down this way. No, so man. he's firing here and then coming on down. So he's like, right. so again, for the people who are listening, like he starts shooting before he's directly underneath you. So you're seeing like yeah. tracers and then him, and then he tips the hat to you. That yeah. sounds like the most wild, like two and a half seconds of anybody's life. But unless you're in oh, it, was, it was, it was cool. It's one of those oh, great man. moments in your life. You know, did one of those you, things that you never get to do again. Did you ever get to know who that was? No, hmm. I mean he could he could have been at some of the sore meetings for all I know. I, I don't know those bad guys. But, uh, yeah, those bad. Yeah, because we have the the you know the spads or the, the sky raider guys. They yeah. they're members of SAR now. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, he had fired. You know, it was like a white smoke kind of thing. It was white smoke coming out of the out of the plane when the rocket launched, mm-hmm. and then when it got like just past me, it it was orange smoke when that when it blew up and all the flechettes come out. Hmm. So, but that anyway, then we flew on back cool. and, uh, the guy we picked up was a mountain yard. He was, uh, one of their team member members. And so when we got back, his, uh, his brother-in-law, um, was, uh, one of the guys on my team. Oh, and so he came over and he appreciated the fact that I, I brought his, brought his body back. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then he, uh, he gave me, he gave me a yard bracelet and all that kind of stuff. Oh, wow. So, but that was that was that mission, and we got him on back, and wow. And then uh, let me see what kind of missions after that. I had another. Uh, uh, I guess maybe we should probably get. Oh, there's got to be some others. Well, let me ask you this, um, because I know that there's uh, there's one mission I know we're going to get to, which which is a bright light mission that. Cobra I mean, in a, in a way, lasted for decades. I mean, and we're going to get into that. I mean, we'll get into that. But, you know, um, before we before we do start approaching that one or, or any others, I kind of want to ask you about the Montagnards you're working with. Um, because uh, um, John Stryker Meyer, Tilt, uh, his team was South Vietnamese. Right. Um, I haven't talked with anybody yet who, who worked with the Montagnard tribes people. Um, and, uh, you know, if you could for the, the listeners, because these, these mountain yard guys were, um, uh, just, they were the team, you know, sure. We're talking right now, you know, we're both white guys speaking English, but what a lot of people kind of through, unfortunately, the fact that, you know, we're just two white guys speaking English together. They don't understand. A lot of people don't just under sure they can hear it, but it, we need to talk about it because they need to understand that the majority of the team was indigenous guys. Right. The majority of every SOG team was indigenous guys. Most of them didn't speak English. Some of them maybe, uh, you know, interpreter, um, some broken English and, and vice versa. So people could talk to each other. But tell me about working with the mountain yards. Who, what, what is a mountain yard? What do they look Montagnard, like? How do French. they go about it that's and good. run us through that? Yeah. It's a French word for mountain people. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're the they're the indigenous people that live in the mountains of Vietnam. They're the indigenous people of Vietnam, actually, because mm-hmm. um, the Vietnamese people are they they migrated down like from China yes. into Vietnam, and they're more the fish eaters, I guess. And the Montagnards are more meat eaters. They mm-hmm. they used to go out in the jungles with loincloths on, and mm-hmm. and they would uh, hunt for you know food and bring it back. With, they hunt with crossbows and bring it on back, and they cook it up and eat it. So they were indigenous people, but they were. Uh, they were wonderful people. I mean, mm-hmm. just amazing, very uh, warm people, very warm people, very re- receiving of people around them. Um, I've always thought that the, that the Vietnamese government doesn't like them. Hmm. And they're going through a, like a, they're going through something like what, what the United States went through years and years ago when with the, down the South with the whites and the blacks yes. kind of thing. So, um, which is really truly sad. And I've always thought the Vietnamese people should use, get to know the mountain yards and use them for guards mm-hmm. because they're much better fighters. They're great fighters. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, they jump right. If they saw a bullet coming, they jump in front of it before it hit you. I mean, it gives their life for you. And then, you know, 
when our government just walks off and leaves them there yeah. like that. We had um, we had a, a a few guys in SOG that actually tried to got, brought a whole bunch of them back to the states. Really, and their child, their offspring are now in the army. A few of them are in special forces. A few of them are doctors. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're 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 wonderful people. They're wow. just unbelievable. They're they're beautiful. Um, but uh, yeah, I had an old Montagnard team. I only had one other American on my team with me. And that was Homer Hungerford, and I guess I should give Homer a plug. Homer <laughs> passed away in 2014. Oh. But Homer had, uh, when I met him, he had seven and a half years of, of combat service, seven and a half years in the military. Wow. And all seven and a half years was, was combat. Whoa. He served in the Second World War, Whoa. and he was a first lieutenant or something. And he served in the uh, Korean War, and I believe he was a captain in the Korea War. Yeah. And uh, he had a hotel in Hawaii. And he had a partner and he had uh, two or three 90 foot yachts. I think he said he lost one, but he had these yachts that were, you know, sailing yachts. He had these big boats. I mean, the guy was, he was like your Ernest Hemingway. Wow. Yeah. And when he took 30 days leave from Vietnam to go back home, he went to Africa and went big game hunting. (laughs) That's the kind of guy. (laughs) But that was Homer Hungerford. Wow. And uh, how but he was quite a guy. He was really quite a guy. And and since I was new in, in special ops, the uh, a lot of the guys didn't know me. Mm-hmm. You know, they wanted me to get a bunch of missions on my belt before they started hanging out with me and mm-hmm. say, well, I don't know if I want to run with you or not. I don't know how much experience you got. Yeah. So so I had a hard time finding people. So what I did is uh, I asked Homer, I said, Homer, you want to run with me? And he goes, sure. So Homer was my one one. And so then I had. Uh, um, five Montagnards that I ran with. Yeah. One of my guys was part Vietnamese in Montagnard, mm-hmm. and he spoke uh, Vietnamese and English, and so and Montagnard. Mm-hmm. And so uh, what I did, if I didn't take my one guy, I won't, I won't mention names, but uh, but the uh, well I can because he he was killed. Tolly was my uh, my uh, uh, interpreter, mm-hmm. and I worked with Tolly mostly, but. Um, I give Tolly, you know, I'd break and not go out on the mission on every mission. And I would take the other guy with me that, that spoke Vietnamese. And then I would speak Vietnamese to him and he would interpret it to, mm. uh, you know, to Montagnard. So that's how that all worked. So that worked out a lot. But most of the Montagnards could speak, they could speak uh, a lot of ta- tacti- uh, tactical words. Oh, wow. Yeah. If I said, don't shoot or go shoot or go after that guy or go this way, oh. they, they knew what I was saying. They just couldn't carry on long, long conversations, but they were, they were excellent, excellent people, the mountain yards. Um, how tall yeah, is your, how tall is your average mountain yard? Um, I would say probably, uh, I think on the tall side, maybe five, eight, five, mm-hmm. ten, maybe at most. Okay. Um, they would be, uh, on the short side, they'd be, heck, some were shorter than me and I'm five, six. Yeah. So I was, I was five, seven back then, but. <laughs> oh, as you get older, you get kind of shrink. But um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, uh, I had a couple of guys that were probably about five six, wow. five seven. Um, they but uh, I trained them, I clothed them, I paid them, everything else. You know, that's what we all did. Hmm. And but you know, we used to do these INA drills all the time. We'd go up to the yard range on your day off. You'd go up there and you train a little bit. But these guys have been training. I mean, they, I wasn't their first team leader. Mm-hmm. They, they've been fighting for a long time, for years. Yeah. yeah, so they they knew all the tactics. I mean, they could teach me, mm. you know. So, But I remember when I used to go up the yard range, the mountain yard range, we, we called it the yard range. I'd go up there and we'd do some shooting and stuff, and they were missing everything. Mm. And I told them, I said, hey, anybody can hit that. Th- 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 I'm giving it away. They hit, <laughs> we had a truck up there on the yard range that was uh, – we use it for like going on the Hoochman Trail, trying to get guys out of the truck. Mm-hmm. And towards the end there, I blew the truck up. So, <laughs> <laughs> so was that what you guys were? What were you, were you guys shooting at the truck, or was it just part of the infrastructure? Yeah, we'd be shooting at the truck, it'd be sitting up there. It was just a, a skeleton of a truck. Okay, so it's just I like a. At it and yeah. I told the guys, I said, anybody who can hit that truck with that sawed-off M seventy nine, I says, I'll um, I'll get you a new pair of pants. Ooh. They hit it every time. Ooh, a little Every incentive. Every freaking time they hit it. That's pretty cool. <laughs> so you're training it with them. It's amazing because that thing shot off and they're quite yeah. a ways away. Yeah. 
you're training with them, you're working with them, um, really intense connection, you know, in relationship with these guys. Um, how'd that play out when you were, um, you know, on, on the ground doing a mission? Um, what was your, what was your, um, how do I want to ask this? I, I guess I'll tell you kind of like where I'm coming from here. I think John Stryker Meyer was pretty, remains pretty adamant, um, that, you know, one of the main reasons he, he survived what he did was because of his people was because of, and he calls them the little people. And he really, um, when he was on my show, he really spent a lot of time talking about how his individual relationship that he built with his, with his folks, um, you know, I mean, he could just get a look from one of them and he would know what that meant. You know, what kind of, what kind of dynamic did you enjoy um, with your mountain yards and what did that look like physically when you're on a mission? Well, when I was, um, when we were there, what I did, I used to go down to their hooch. I used to go down their little, their, uh, uh, their village mm-hmm. and I'd go down to the village and, uh, I drink rice wine with them. We'd mm-hmm. have barbecues. They'd go hunting and bring a mm-hmm. animal back and we, you know, and we'd barbecue it. So I did a lot. They had a music thing. We cranked up Victrola. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, we'd, we'd, we'd go do all that kind of stuff. I partied with them a lot and we got along well. Uh, but out in the field, I learned a lot from them. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'd say something like, let's go this way. And then they might say, no, no, let's not go that way. Let's go this other way here. I says, because I think it'd be safer and I go, why? And they tell me, he says, because I know their tactics. They're going to come around mm-hmm. this other way or whatever. So we'd move away. And um, we never did did INA drills like they were supposed to be done. You know, mm-hmm. you see you know, the perfect INA drill. You see where they break off. One guy shoots and goes mm-hmm. through the middle and keep peeling off, going back. And if you have to start over again, you do. Yeah. That thing works really great if you're on level ground or something. But but if mm-hmm. you're out in the jungle and you're in a battle, it's like yeah. you, it's, you take cover and you just start fighting and then peel back, yeah. you know, it, uh, yeah, it's kind of hard. I mean, if you can do that sort of thing, it's really great, but most of the fights that I've been in, you haven't been able to do that. Mm-hmm. So an immediate action, they, they, uh, just so the people who are listening an IA drill means an immediate action drill. Uh, right. And it's, and that's, that's, uh, classically what I've read about, and especially in John Plaster's books, um, is, you know, you, you are preparing for that moment where, you you break contact with the enemy, and since you're a numer- you're usually in a SOG team situation, you're a numerically inferior force. You need to um, establish uh, fire supremacy really quickly. So an IA drill is an immediate action drill, and it was curtailed to the instance, um, but you know it was rehearsed. And what's really interesting is that you know I'm hearing from you that it's like well you know in in a lot of the situations we were in the classic immediate action drill wasn't applicable. So we really had to adjust per situation. And I think that yeah. means a whole lot more of individual skill, you know, and you just be, need to be able to intuit what we need to do now. And I think that requires an even higher level of training. Um, I guess, yeah, it would t- you have to, you have to have uh, confidence. Yeah. I, you know, I think confidence is the biggest thing when okay. you're in a battle. Uh, you don't have time to sit and think a lot about what you have to do. It's mm-hmm. got to be immediate. So um, we would just kind of sit down and talk about that sort of thing. And instead of like rehearsing it, because you can't really rehearse it unless you're in that situation. Mm-hmm. So, um, but it always worked out for me. I mean, I've never lost a man. Mm-hmm. Um, even on the A team, I'm trying to think, no, I've, I've never lost a man. And, and uh, I had, Somewhere between forty and fifty missions total, yeah. out in the out in the bush, and uh, I've never lost anybody. Wow. Wounded, yeah, we uh, we've been wounded a few times, but uh, other than that, no, mm-hmm. no problems. So I guess I did something right, but you don't know when you're going to get into those really nasty situations until it happens. Yeah. You know, nobody goes out there looking for them. You know, you don't go out there looking for run into a regiment. What was you know, the nastiest I mean, situation you got into running with SOG? Uh, it was probably on the Code Grade 4. Well, we can get that one in a little bit. But the uh, <clears throat> I had one where uh, one of the guys lost a man on his team, and my team was down again. 
And so they asked me if I wanted to run with him. I said, sure. I went over and talked to him. His name was Hill. I can't even remember the team. Um, but I went over to him and I said, um, I hear you got a mission coming up. And he goes, yeah. I said, I heard you lost a man. He goes, yeah. I says, you want me to run with you? He goes, you'd run with me? I go, yeah. He says, he goes, great. He says, we're going to run a couple of days. He says, like three days, we're going to run the mission. He said, we're back bagging up now. And he says, if you, uh, if you want, you can go on a visual recon. And so the, tomorrow, so I did, I went in the visual recon and I asked him, I said, what is the mission anyway? He goes, they want us to go and knock out a tank, you know, an enemy tank. Now I'm going, are you serious? You know how many bad guys are going to be around that tank? <laughs> They're not going to let that tank be bop down the road by itself. Yeah, yeah. There's going to be a thousand guys around that tank. So anyway, so um, I did a visual recon. It was all slash and burn. And that's a cultivate, cultivating thing mm -hmm. <clears throat> where the, they, they grow props yeah. out in the jungle and then they, they what they do is they, they they cut it all down and it looks like kind of like um, when you're flying over and look down mm -hmm. all you see is bare ground and it looks like uh tic-tac-toe you know like this yeah you know what I, and so you, the only place you can go is in between there you can't walk across those open fields mm -hmm. so we're trying to figure out how to get on the ground so i picked out a couple of spots and he he agreed he said those are two spots that he wanted to pick out as well so uh and there was a he said, if we run into any problems after that, we'll just have to play it by eye. So anyway, we're flying in and we're getting close to the ground. And all of a sudden, bullets are flying all over the frigging place. They're going through the chopper, too. I mean, you, can, you can hear them going by oh, you. Geez. You can hear them hitting the chopper. None of us got hit. So they pull out of there and we go and says, put us in our secondary. Mm -hmm. So we go over to the secondary. We're getting down the ground. All of a sudden, the same thing. Bullets are flying. Oh, tink, 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 chopper. <laughs> all over the place. Still, none of us got hit. Wow. So he, he gets up there between the seats and he goes, uh, put us down over there. <laughs> so uh, we go over there and we're getting closer to the ground. And then all of a sudden, bullets, ting, ting, ting. You hear the bullets flying. Oh, man. And all of a sudden I hear, I'm hit, I'm hit, I'm hit. And so he got hit in the foot. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, he had one foot hanging off the side of the chopper. Yeah. And uh, it, it hit him in the foot, almost knocked him out, out of the chopper. So the only thing that helped, helped him with it was a litter pole sitting there mm -hmm. on the Huey for putting litters in mm -hmm. and uh, he held on to that litter pole mm -hmm. and that Kevin, I grabbed over and grabbed his arm because when that happens, the chopper pulls up really quick. Mm -hmm. So you get a lot of centrifugal force. Yeah. So, yeah. So we, I got him, I held on to him and got him back. We got, we had canceled the mission right there. Well, that I, was I can't believe that, you know, this is something that, um, you know, I, 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 <laughs> I hear this, I hear this and I am dumbfounded. It's like, we're going into the first landing zone. You get shot out. We're trying it again. Okay. It's like, it's not just like, okay, they know we're here. We're done. It's like, okay, we're trying it again. You get shot out again. And it's like, hey, all right, let's find another one. Let's keep trying. I, would there, was there ever going to have been like a fourth attempt or was three enough and getting somebody wounded? Like if somebody hadn't been wounded, would there have been a fourth insertion attempt? Uh, well, if, if, um, yeah, there might have been. Oh, they geez. might have put us off. We might have had to repel in or something, you know, and, oh, and try to work our way over to yeah. it. But they already know you're there. Right. I mean, it's obvious they know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, when I came back, I told them, I said, drop a bomb on it. Yeah. <laughs> they're there. We know they're there. Like you mentioned yeah. earlier, the the uh, North Vietnamese guy just walking out of the forest and saying, go, you know, turn around and go back. It's like, well, you know, they're there, you know. Time to put an arc yeah. light right there. But then again, with the intelligence leaks, they would have known an arc light was coming and they'd have to move their stuff and, and nothing happens fast with the bureaucracy. But that's my thing. It's like, well, they're there. They might have they might have looked at it like Saigon might have looked at it like, um, well, we don't know how many enemy troops around there. Let's you know, see if we can get a guy on the ground, and find out how many enemy around mm -hmm. there. Well, they found out. <laughs> 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 so that ended that mission. And so then we went ahead and uh, we just came came on back to, yeah. to Doc To and then back down to Contum. Mm -hmm. And then it was after that, I, I had a couple of other missions where, you know, they've just, we were looking, you know, oh, we had road watch missions. Mm -hmm. You know, you go down the road and you try to count the trucks go by. Yeah. And you, if you can, you try to see what's inside the trucks. Mm hmm you know, so we did a couple of like, those kind of missions. Are you taking pictures uh, of the trucks as well? You know, document that they're there. Um, it's kind of hard to get the pictures because it's uh, they usually come down at night. Mm -hmm. All you got to do is see lights. Sure. 
Okay, so it's nighttime. It's nighttime to avoid. Yeah, this this is before we had starlight cameras. Of and all course, yeah. And starlight scopes were huge back uh -huh. then. They, they, were, they were huge. And, yeah. So now they're. Right of course, there. now they have the. Uh, you know, it was a big thing for me when I, uh, you know, saw the very first uh, kind of images of the new quad tube. Um, you know, they have like the they're the four tube night vision goggles that they have now that are the current generation for for special forces guys the the gp nvg 18s and i remember wow. those were so hot when those first showed up everybody every every uh every civilian with too much money wanted to get one so they could so they could play like they were special forces but i think they retail for like sixty thousand dollars to oh, uh, to to a civilian so you know it's like just you know you want to wear gp nvgs go join the army <laughs> You know, or if you're really rich and you want to and you want to play, then go do that. But yeah, the the amount of evolution and the thing is about talking about this stuff is, is that, you know, what you folks were doing was, you know, such a proto for um, the the special forces community and the special operations community that conducts war fighting now for the United States and and has now defined the way the modern world conducts war fighting. You know, it's a very, very important part of how modern nation states fight. And in a way, um, Vietnam was the crucible for, for, for figuring that out. So the fact that you guys were doing what you were doing without that kind of technology just goes to show the, you said Bob Howard was full of guts. And I think that anybody who is doing this kind of stuff was full of guts. So I know it's difficult to say that I'm about yourself, but I'll say it, I'll now. say it for you. <laughs> Yeah, I'm getting big guts now. Oh, boy. <laughs> I've got to lose it. This has been a production of Modern Military History. The mission of Modern Military History is to make military history accessible in the modern age. Want to learn more about Modern Military History? Check out the website, www.modernmilitaryhistory.com.